All right, so in this video, we're gonna take a look at a handful of ways to use internal bus routing in Pro Tools. We thank the creator for our time today. Let's get into it. All right, so what we have here is a very simple Pro Tools session. We have an acoustic drum kit uh, laid out here, and we have a bass track. So we're just going to keep this super simple as we work through things. Now under the setup menu, we have an I.O. window, and this I.O. window is going to display any bus that we actually use. Right now, there's a main output being used on the outputs of all the tracks, and that is being mapped to output one and two of my audio interface. So as we create buses, they will show up in here. We can create things manually by coming in here and choosing New Path. We may do that in just a few moments, but there's also a much easier interactive way to do a lot of assignments when we're working through the software, okay? So the first example that we're going to show here, example number one, is how to create a submix and what a submix is for. So I'm going to select the drum tracks here, click and shift click, and we're going to go shift alt and click on the output of a track and I want all of these outputs to go to a new track. And this is going to be a stereo aux track, and this is going to be called my drum sub. Now, I'm in the habit of capitalizing things like a sub SUB because if a track name does not fit within the available character space, it will always abbreviate to capital letters. Um, just get in the habit of capitalizing certain letters to always show up in track names and that's just my own naming convention. So what's happened here as a result? All of the track outputs now are going to a new bus that Pro Tools has created automatically named Drum Sub, which is coming into this stereo aux. And if we look at this in the mix window, control equals to switch over on Windows, then we can see the outputs here that are coming into this single aux track, okay? What is the reason for this track? Well, uh, maybe the most obvious, I'll mute the bass for a moment, is that this gives us a single track control for the drum kit as a whole, whatever that section of tracks might be for you. All right, so we have level control here on the fader, and we also have a point of processing control on all these tracks simultaneously as well. So if I wanted to, I could go in here and insert an EQ, All right, I could apply an EQ to the drum kit, shaping anything the way that we want to. Now, in most scenarios with a drum kit, I think it makes more sense to approach each track individually first and, uh, and then look at global processing if you need any at all. But that's an example of where that could happen. And of course, submixing can be used for a lot of different kinds of sections of tracks in a session. So there's a number of different ways you might utilize something like that. But that's method number one that's called a submix, okay? Now something else has happened here, and that is that if I play from here, let's say that I solo the snare track to listen to just the snare for a minute. Well, we don't hear the snare, and that's because the continuing signal flow of the snare is going through this track, and this track would need to be soloed as well. So what would actually help me is if the snare, or not the snare, if this aux were in a permanent soloed state so that I could just solo any track at will and always have this one soloed so I don't have to bother with it. That's called solo safing. And on Windows, we do that by holding the control key down and clicking on the solo button. And now that will always be in a solo mode. So now if we solo just the snare track, we hear the snare perfectly fine, okay? So we solo safe auxes a lot, probably 90% of the time, uh, but there are examples when you wouldn't, and I'll show you one of those examples in, uh, in just a moment. Okay, so method number one is a submix. Method number two, I'm gonna create another stereo aux, and I'm gonna name this one uh, Reverb Effects, okay? Now, with the way that I'm gonna utilize this track, um, I am gonna go ahead and solo safe this, and what is the purpose of this track? Well, let's look at the snare for a moment. We're just gonna solo the snare. 
And I'm just going to insert on this track um, the mod delay plugin. Okay, just a straight delay plugin. And uh, let's see, I'm just going to link both sides here. We'll give ourselves a little bit of feedback on this. So right now there is no delay. And as we bring this up, All right, now what we need to pay attention to here is that any percentage of the effect is how much the original has gone down. So 20% mix means that we've lost 20% of the original snare, and that means the overall level actually of the snare and the presence of the snare has changed. So if I click play here, we bring this all the way up here, you can hear how the delay itself is starting to be louder than the original snare. This is the challenge with time-based effects, effects that are based on time, delay time, reverb time, um, chorusing sometimes. Uh, so there are plugins that are kind of in between. It depends on what you're using them for. But for this reason, we don't want to compromise the strength and the presence of the snare, but we do want to hear reverb on the snare. So what we do is we apply reverb to a copy of the snare. That way we have the best of both worlds. We have the original and we have the effect at the same time. And we do that using a send. A send is a copy. So I'm gonna click on the first send here, and I'm gonna to go to the track that I've already created, and this example is the Reverb Effects track. So we click on that. Pro Tools has automatically created now a bus for me named Reverb Effects after the track that it was going to. Okay, that's cool. What we also get here is a floating send fader. And so this is how much of a copy is gonna to go to this reverb track. And we're gonna go ahead in here and I'm going to assign the Air Reverb plugin. Okay, and that send fader right there, that floating fader is how much of a copy from this track is going into the reverb for feedback. And uh, so our reverb on this track is always gonna be at 100%. A delay would always be at 100%, okay? The purpose of this track is effect. The purpose of this track is to remain dry. So I'm gonna close this floating fader and just show you that there's a really neat trick in here. If we hold the control key down and click on the assignment right there, we get that little send fader just right in there as well. Now this is a little bit harder to control, but you can always hold down the control key and get fine fader adjustments in here. You can always park that exactly where you want it, even though it's a small fader, okay? So control click on the assignment, control click on the fader for fine tuning there. And uh, that's really the best way to work, I think, is to have all your send faders kind of in channel strips here. It keeps things nice and neat and easy to understand what's going on. Okay, so that is called time-based routing, and that's method number two. Method number three, uh, I'm gonna go back to the snare track here. I'm gonna take another send. I'm gonna go on send number two, and I'm gonna take send number two to a new track, and this time it's gonna be a mono aux, and I'm gonna call this snare uh, DYN. Snare DYN, what is that for? So DYN is gonna be for dynamics. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating what's called parallel processing. Parallel processing means that I want to apply a process to the snare, a really extreme process to the snare, but I don't want to make that sound all about that extreme processing that's happening. I wanna be able to mix it in just a little bit. So I need a way to mix in a really strong effect that I just want to hear a little bit of. And so there are a couple different uses for that. It could be distortion. I could have named this snare D-I-S-T for distortion. And in this example, I did it for dynamics for a compression example. All right, so we have another send here. I'm gonna control click right there. We have the send fader. My send fader is at Unity by default. And so what I'm gonna do here is on this snare dynamic track, uh, I'm going to solo both of these for right now. I'm going to insert here um, a compressor plugin that I like, the Purple Audio MC77 from Avid. 
Um, I like this plugin because it's an 1176 model that's very smooth. And so I want to explain to you for a moment what I'm trying to do here. Let's switch over to slip mode here, and I'm going to zoom in. And what I want to pay close attention to is the way that we have a, a snare peak here, and then we have this elongated decay off of the snare drum, okay? So this decay is from just the resonance, the natural resonance of the snare, but that's also capturing a little bit of the room that the snare is in at the same time. And I want to draw out a little bit more of that decay. If I turn the track up, then I start clipping on the peak, right? So I can't just make things louder. I have to control that peak. But there's something really important about this peak to begin with, and that's the attack, right? That initial smack of the snare. And I don't want to compromise that too much. Um, I want to hear that snare really, really tight. I want to hear that attack, that really present attack that's there. I don't want to take that away. But at the same time, I want to hear more of this. So that's the conundrum that we have right there. So what we're doing is we're taking a copy of the snare to this track. And the whole purpose of this track is going to be to control that peak and take that peak down and then open up for the decay to come through. And as you can see on this compressor, there is no wet dry mix, right? So I can't measure just a little bit of this extreme compression to happen on the original track. The only way for me to use this is on a separate track, and then I get a wet dry mix on this fader by how much of this compressor I want to hear. So the way this compressor works is the attack all the way up is a fast attack. The release all the way up is a fast release. We want to hit the attack of the snare and let go. And so we're just suppressing that peak and letting go so that we can hear the decay after the peak. And we do that by just driving this input here. I'm just going to crank the level of the snare going into this compressor. And a little bit heavier compression. We can always play with these things and try to find this kind of middle ground as we get into it. But I think these settings are going to be extreme and really obvious to notice. So I'm going to actually only solo this track. Now, if I only want to hear the compressed snare, the problem I have right now is that this is soloed, but the track that it's coming from is not. So I'm not going to hear anything during playback right now. Nothing, we're in playback and nothing is happening. So the way you fix that is you make this send prefader. And by making that send prefader, this track is its own track now. It's kind of an island. It'd be the same thing, honestly, as if we just duplicated this audio track to begin with and put a really heavy compressor on it. It's the same way to do the same thing, right? It's another way to do the same thing. But in this example, I'm just showing you an example of how to use a send in a slightly different way and how to do parallel processing in this way with an aux track. So by making this pre-fader, that send is coming out before the fader and the mute on this track, and that makes this track its own island, okay? And I still have a really short selection in there that just stopped, so there we go. Okay. So that attack is getting through just a little bit, isn't it? but you can hear how much of the decay is really cutting through there. So I'm going to solo the original as well. And we're going to, we're just going to mute the reverb for a moment. Keep it dry. Now we have more decay and more ring on the snare. And we just mix those two in together. So this is peak, this is decay. And how much of each do you want from the snare to put that together? That's what's happening there in parallel processing. Okay, we'll pull that reverb down over there. Okay, so that's method number three is parallel routing. Method number four is going to be four and five together. Kind of show you two things at the same time. And this is where our bass track is going to come in as well. So what we're going to do here is I have a scenario where the 
the kick and the bass kind of happen at the same time. And this is kind of a, a popular production technique, which is in the mix, when the kick is happening, okay, what is the bass doing? Is the bass conflicting with what the kick is doing when the kick happens? And naturally, low frequencies are going to overlap. Any frequencies that are similar are going to kind of overlap and cancel each other a little bit. But a technique that we do sometimes is to say, well, I really don't want to lose the beat. I really don't want to lose that pump of the kick when it's happening. And as you can see here, our bass is kind of consistent uh, with these eighth notes in here. Okay, so the point is that when these things overlap, okay, when this kick comes in right here, I want to hear that kick really soundly, and I don't want the bass frequencies to, to kind of fight against that when that happens. And I want to really get that attack of the kick without it being compromised by the bass. And so this is a technique called side chaining that a lot of people use. And the way we do this is we could use, uh, well, I'm gonna create the plugin first. So on this track, I'm gonna use the Avid Pro Compressor, okay? The Pro Compressor is actually a really good compressor plugin. It's one of my defaults uh, because it has several different modes and algorithms for compression. It does have a wet dry mix built into it. There's some cool features that are built into this plugin, a lot of different ways to use it. But what I wanna do is I want to find, uh, I'll show you a little bit about compression in here. Um, as well. And uh, so for right now, I'm going to uh, reset the bass to, uh, to Unity here. I'm going to control click on this until I see the peak level. And I'm just going to see what the peak level of the bass is, like from here to here. All right, I'm at about minus 12. So at anything above minus 12, I'm really not having any effect on that at all. And a couple of these are even a little bit lower. So I'm going to set this to, I could set this to minus 15, because uh, a couple of these are a little quieter. But again, the whole point of this is to compress the bass and, and to kind of duck the bass very quickly, momentarily, when a kick happens. And so I'm going to just start this at like minus 20, okay? And I want a fast response um, on this compressor when this is coming in, and I'm going to do a fast attack time. And when the compressor hits the bass, how long does the bass stay suppressed? And we don't want to completely lose the bass, so we can use some numbers in here. I'm just going to zoom in. You know, how long is my kick from here to here? And it's 55 milliseconds. That's ticks. Let's go to minutes and seconds. So it's 41 milliseconds, okay, for a length for the kick there. So I might say, okay, the release needs to be up by 40 milliseconds. So let's just go in here and make this 30. And it wouldn't even be, it would make probably even more sense to make that a little bit faster. We just wanna make sure we catch really this initial punch and kind of wave of the kick right there. We've got about 19 milliseconds there, but there's no right or wrong there. I'm just kind of showing you how you can use real numbers to figure out what some of these things should be as a starting point, right? So um, now how much of the base, how much do I wanna duck the base? We don't ever want to hear that this ducking is happening. We don't want to hear the behavior, the, the behavior, excuse me, of the compressor. We just want to be able to hear a clean kick, right? So, um, so I might take this up a little bit. I'll take this up to like a five to one. Um, but remember, this needs to duck the bass and jump right back in. So as long as your release time isn't too long, um, it shouldn't be as noticeable when this is going on. All right, so we're not side-chaining anything yet. We have the compressor set up the way that we want it to. Um, now, the problem right now is that I'm compressing the bass the whole time. That's not what I want. All I want to do is to compress the bass when a kick happens. And that's where side-chaining comes in. So I'm going to switch back over to the mixer here, and we're going to take a look at the output of the track this time. I could take a send to a bus for this key input right here. But instead, I'm going to show you how to do a mult. And in order to do this, I need to create a bus manually. So I'm going to create a new 
monopath in here, and I'm going to call this kick side for my kick sidechain bus. Okay. I create this manually, and then it's going to show up to me in the bus list. So how do we create a mult on the output of a track? How do we take a track to multiple outputs at the same time? I'm going to hold the start key down and click here. And I'm going to go to the bus list and click on kick side. And you can see I have two check marks there that the output of this track is going to two destinations simultaneously. And it gives me a little plus symbol in there to tell me that. This little plus symbol is actually really effective because a lot of times we're using quick keys and modifiers. We can accidentally create mults in a session that are just really confusing the heck out of us trying to figure out what's going on with our audio. And um, so it actually is a really helpful indicator. If you don't want to mult somewhere and it's telling you there is one, you're like, oh, I'm hearing this twice or whatever. So in this example, though, the output of the track is also going to that sidechain bus. And that bus, as it turns out, is going to go to the input of this plugin. Kick side is going right here. And now I need to tell the compressor to follow an external trigger for its own behavior. So the bus is there, but it's not following the bus yet. So I go down here to the sidechain source, and I set this to external. I want you to follow that external key input uh, that's coming from somewhere else for your behavior. Okay, and that's when the compression is going to happen. So we're going to solo both of these here and just see what kind of behavior we're getting on the compressor now. And my bass was down here somewhere. It's a little bit loud right now, but that's all right. Right, so you can see the compressor is hitting every time there's a kick. Now, do we notice this really heavy compression coming in? No, we don't really notice that at all. I might need to play with these settings a little bit to kind of fine tune it. But you understand that the kick is triggering the behavior of the compressor on the bass. And that way, every time a kick happens, the bass is just momentarily suppressed enough for us to not lose the beat. We're keeping the beat in there. Really common technique that's, that's happening today. So I call that four and five because I'm showing you how to do a mult and showing you how to do a side chain at the same time. All right. So there's a handful of ways of how to use bus routing in Pro Tools software. In other DAWs, side chaining like this is often done from track assignments rather than manual bus assignments, but that's how it's done here. I hope that was helpful to you. Have fun experimenting with some of these things. Go create some.